I had a really difficult time with high school. The biggest struggle was my school was able to provide certain accommodations, but only if I limited myself to a certain curriculum. They had a textbook already for the remedial biology class, but I was in advanced placement biology and they weren't willing to acquire a textbook for that course. So their solution is just take remedial biology. That's where the other blind kids are. The idea of, well, maybe I don't need your help and I could just do it on my own like any other 16 year old didn't really occur to them. Especially when you're in a STEM field, your math classes versus your more general ed classes are going to be very different in how you need to approach them. A lot of these sensors and a lot of the software that we use to interpret data from them are already accessible for me. A really great example of this is the Talking Lab Quest from Independent Science. It was really easy for my school to acquire the talking version from their supplier. Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. Jamie Prince Zapato has been blind since birth, and she's transitioned from high school to homeschool and to college. As a young child, Jamie developed an interest in science and mathematics. She followed this pursuit all the way to the University of Colorado at Boulder, where now she's a physics major. Her love for the study of science and the teaching of science has led her to develop a STEM curriculum where blind and visually impaired teens will have the opportunity to gain confidence and skills in learning science, technology, engineering, and mathematics through her STEM program. Jamie's journey has not always been a smooth ride, and she wants to share with you some of her ups and downs and some of her successes. But most of all, she wants to let you know that you too can do it. I, I can understand it from my parents' perspective. When you have somebody who has all of the markings of an expert on vision loss and on educating people with low vision, telling you this is how it has to be, you can get a little intimidated, especially when you're already in the uncertain environment of raising a teenager. I love this stuff too. I've actually been studying um, gravitational theory. Imagine that you have a trampoline. There's nothing on it, it's just flat. But now I'm gonna take a bowling ball and I'm just going to set it in the middle of the trampoline. What's going to happen to it? It's going to dip in towards wherever the bowling ball is sitting. Now I'm gonna put a ping pong ball on the edge of the trampoline. What's that ping pong ball going to do? It's going to be attracted towards that distortion in the space that the bowling ball is sitting on. And for more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out at www.blindabilities.com, on Twitter at BlindAbilities, and download our free Blind Abilities app from the App Store. That's two words, Blind Abilities. And a special appreciation to Chi Chow for his beautiful music, Lala Tune. Thank you, Chi Chow. Hi, Jamie. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Slightly less stressed out now that I've got the new update of Skype. It wasn't letting me log in for a while. Jamie Prince Prado studying physics, getting her master's degree at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And Jamie, you're part of the Colorado Space Grants Consortium. Can you tell our listeners what that is? The Colorado Space Grant Consortium is one of 50 space grant consortiums. There's one in every state. We receive funding from NASA so that we can provide hands-on learning experiences for college students who are interested in careers in space science and engineering. Wow, one in every state. Mm -hmm. There's one in every state. My understanding is that you've been involved in these space grant consortiums for quite some time. Yes. What was that like the first time you got involved? Well, when I first heard about the consortium, it was through my community college. They were trying to put together a team of students to build a high-altitude balloon payload. Um, this would be essentially an instrument package that we design and send all the way to the edge of space, way up in, through the stratosphere via a balloon. And we would use this opportunity to do a space science experiment that's difficult to do from the ground. So the very first thing I got to do with Space Grant is design what's called a cloud chamber. This is a uh, ionized radiation detector um, that we typically use in a lab setting, but 
very seldom, almost never, would use in a edge of space setting because they're bulky and they're delicate. So my task was to design a cloud chamber that was hardy enough to fly on a balloon all the way to space and allow us to get an idea of what kind of radiation environment we have at the edge of space. Oh, wow, that's quite exciting. And you stuck with this program. I loved it. There was no stopping me after that. Is that considered a STEM program? Absolutely. Which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Yes. And that's something that you have started at the University of Colorado at Boulder. This is correct. And that is called, now let me guess, Project BLAST. That is what it's called. There is something a little different about Project BLAST, though. We already have space grant teams at Colorado. In fact, the space grant program in Colorado is stationed at the University of Colorado. That's our main headquarters. But there wasn't really much of an effort as an organization to actively reach out to underrepresented students, particularly students who are blind. They reached me, mostly by accident, but I wanted to make sure that other students who are blind and interested in STEM had the same opportunities that I had. So that's why I started Project BLAST. So Jamie, can you explain to our listeners what the Project BLAST curriculum will look like? Project BLAST is going to be a series of hands-on workshops that essentially teach the skills that, the practical skills that students need to be successful in science engineering. There's a lot more to science and engineering than just consuming science, than reading a textbook and understanding lectures and passing tests. A lot of it is knowing how to take a question and turn it into something that you can actually dig into and investigate and find the answers for yourself. That's an entirely different skill set than I think what most people are getting in the classroom. And it requires that you have a project to work on and mentors to guide you through that project. That's really cool. So what kind of projects have you developed for this STEM program? We're starting Project Blast with just the development of tools. How do we build the things that we need to do science and to explore the world? And so the very first workshop, which is scheduled for June, is going to be a hands-on electronics workshop where we design and then solder our own continuity testers. Ah, yes, soldering. I've done a little bit of soldering. I work with bigger wires and stuff like that. But when you get down into like the guitar pickups and getting aiming, (laughs) no way. (laughs) I I would have to disagree. It it can be scary, but you can definitely still do it without sight. (laughs) Yeah. Some people think my woodworking, I taught woodworking to blind students. They think that's scary. But, you know, I kind of think, you know, it's the accuracy. But I'm sure you're teaching a good way. Now, the continuity tester... That's to make sure that you have a completed circuit, correct? Correct. And these will be audible continuity testers and tactile for that matter. So when you, when you touch the probes to whatever circuit you're testing and there is a current, the continuity tester that we've designed for the workshop should emit a small beep as well as a vibration. Not a shock. Not a shock. Just a vibration. Well, that's good. Well, Jamie, with your STEM program, what age group are you looking for? We're currently planning on high schoolers that are close to entering college. So basically the transition age group. Well, that's great. Are you looking locally or are you looking nationwide? Presently, this is going to be the Colorado area. We're working very closely with the Colorado Center for the Blind, and they're helping us recruit students through their summer program. Oh, that's really good. That's, um, that's a good perk for having a training center in your state. It is. The Colorado Center for the Blind is wonderful. Now, Jamie, you've actually entered this into a contest for the Holman Prize Mm -hmm. with the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And I've heard you've actually made it through the first stage. How'd that go? That actually went really well. They chose, I think, about 50 of the 200 applicants as semifinalists. And the project that I submitted is one of them. Well, congratulations on that, especially for a STEM program. Thank you. So, Jamie, can you tell us a little bit about your high school experience growing up, transitioning to college? What was that experience like? I had a really difficult time with high school. Um, I, I was in public school for a while, and the biggest struggle was that my school was able to provide certain accommodations, but only if I limited myself to a certain curriculum, which is to say... They had a textbook already for the remedial biology class, but I was in advanced placement biology. 
and they weren't willing to acquire a textbook for that course. So their solution is just take remedial biology. That's where the other blind kids are. And after meeting the other blind kids at my school, it occurred to me that they weren't in remedial classes because they needed to be. They were there for the same reason I was, because that's what they had resources for, and that's what the department that handled accommodations for students who were blind was most equipped to handle. Um, so high school was a series of frustrations relating to getting accommodations that were for the classes that were appropriate for me. So it actually sounds like they had a blind path. Essentially, yes. And it wasn't, it wasn't the path that you would expect a student who wants to be a scientist to be on. Oh, no challenge. I mean, what's the challenge if you have to do remedial if you're an advanced student? Precisely. No challenges and very little opportunity as well. Um, the thought of doing things that were extracurricular made my TVIs tremble a little bit. <laughs> um, and they were very discouraging of that. They would insist that I would need to get a parent to agree to be on campus with me during any extracurricular activities, or I just wouldn't be able to participate because they can't be there to help me. And that was fine. The idea of, well, maybe I don't need your help and I could just do it on my own like any other 16-year-old didn't really occur to them. And this administration is making these decisions. Yes. And they were decisions that my parents were willing to argue on, but I, I can understand it from my parents' perspective. When you have somebody who has all of the markings of an expert on vision loss and on educating people with low vision, telling you this is how it has to be, you can get a little intimidated, especially when you're already in that uncertain uncertain environment of raising a teenager. Exactly. So my parents tried to advocate for me, but eventually the solution that we came to was homeschooling. And that's what most of my high school education was like. I was homeschooled and received all of the accommodations I needed because we could provide them at home. Well, that's really unique. Obviously, you've succeeded, you're a physics major, and can you tell us PC or Apple? I used JAWS in the beginning. Um, I didn't start using Apple until, until really recently. Um, I needed a new computer anyway, and I was going to be paying my tuition out of pocket, so I was trying to cut corners, and if I didn't have to purchase JAWS for myself, it was going to be a lot easier. So voiceover was the way to go. Screen readers. Now that does make it different, doesn't it? It really does. Um, I, I wish there were more screen reader options that were just built in like that. It seems like we're making some improvements. We got NVDA, uh, we got Narrator. But, you know, with Apple, a lot of people always say it's for social networking, not productivity. I, I would agree. Um, I do kind of miss my PC. My suggestion to a lot of students is that if you're going to go into the workplace, you should have a good basic knowledge of a PC and its accessibility. Right. So how's your college experience going right now, today? Um... I don't want to say that it's all smooth sailing because I think that would be really misleading. I definitely still run into snags here and there, um, particularly with working out test accommodations because not all classes are going to be the same, um, especially when you're in a STEM field. Your math classes versus your more general ed classes are going to be very different in how you need to approach them. But I feel like I'm in an environment where people are willing to listen to me when I present concerns. And I'm with people that can see blind people as successful. And that makes a huge difference. When I go to my disability services office and I tell them I'm taking, I don't know, classical mechanics, and this is going to be a really math heavy course. And so I need these accommodations. They don't look at me like I'm crazy as soon as I say I'm taking a physics class. Now, this is a relationship with your disability services office that you developed. Yes. Though I will say it started off pretty good. I had gone to another college previously and had gotten used to that scenario that I described where you walk into disability services and you tell them what you want to do and they kind of look at you like you have two heads. Like, nobody does that. What do you mean? We're not equipped for that. But when I came out to Colorado and I started attending school out here, it was very different. I was hesitant at first. I didn't really know what to expect. And so I started slowly just getting my math requirements out of the way first, so just to see how it goes. Because if I have too much trouble with math, then maybe I'm going to have a lot of trouble with physics classes later on. 
Now with science classes, I know you have labs. How are the labs going for you? Labs in physics are probably the easiest labs I've ever done in a science class. So it's all virtual, just like that friction-free sheet of ice that they talk about in physics. So can you give the listeners a little detail on your labs? Most of the lab. So when we're talking about some hypothetical sheet of ice that has literally no friction, we're trying to simplify a problem because in the real world, things are very complicated. There are so many variables that factor into what we're trying to calculate and what we're trying to understand. If we can make some of those variables go away in the theoretical case, it makes it a lot easier to investigate the specific details that we want to look at. In labs, we start looking more at what's happening in the real world. Do these theoretical ideas that we've been investigating actually make sense? Can we observe things in our environment that suggest that this is actually what's going on? Or are we seeing something completely different and maybe we have to go back to the drawing board and start over? So that's what the labs help us with. We obviously don't have access to a real frictionless surface or we, we can't really have a falling object that doesn't experience air resistance, but we can get fairly close. So Jamie, do you use any type of accommodation in your labs? Yes and no, it really depends on the lab. Sometimes I do, um, but a lot of the time what I found is that the accommodations that I need to use are things that my peers in the classroom have to use as well. For example, we can't see momentum, and we can't really see velocity. All we can really observe is change in position. And sometimes that change in position is happening really fast. Like, for example, if we have an object hanging from a spring and it starts bouncing, well, it's very difficult to tell exactly when it reaches the lowest point in its bounce with your eyes. And so my peers would use computers for this. We would set up sensors and we would plug them into computers and we would let the sensor tell us when the object is at its lowest point and when it starts moving away from the sensor again. And a lot of these sensors and a lot of the software that we use to interpret the data, data from them are already accessible for me. A really great example of this is the Talking Lab Quest from Independent Science. The Talking Lab Quest. Can you describe that? Essentially, a little handheld computer with all of the sensor attachments that you would need to do various lab experiments in a physics lab. And the awesome thing is a lot of professors, especially in community colleges and other two-year colleges, will already be using these. Well, that's awesome that it's accessible. I wonder if the teachers even know that they're accessible. I don't know that my professor knew ahead of time that these were accessible. He wasn't using the talking version, but it was really easy for my school to acquire the talking version from their supplier. Once again, that's manufactured by? Independent Science. Well, that's great that it's available. Jamie, in physics, I'm kind of curious, do you ever study gravity? All the time. That's actually where you start. Oh, that's great because... When I was in physics, mm -hmm. my, we studied gravity, and I was always intrigued by it. And my physics teacher told me, well, don't get sucked into it. <laughs> so there are a lot of physicists that will tell you that gravity is not even a force. Rather, gravity is what we get when our entire space-time is curved in places. I mean, me personally, for me to sleep well at night, I had to come up with something. So I used to use uh, an example of a balloon being expanded in space and the distortion of space being packed all around it and stuff like that caused the effect of gravity. That's, that's a very interesting way to illustrate it. Another way that is actually fairly common in intro astronomy classes is imagine that you have a trampoline and there's nothing on it, it's just flat. But now I'm going to take a bowling ball and I'm just going to set it in the middle of the trampoline. What's going to happen to it? The trampling will sag where the weight of the bowling ball is. Exactly. It's going to dip in towards wherever the bowling ball is sitting. Now I'm going to put a ping pong ball on the edge of the trampoline. What's that ping pong ball going to do? It will be drawn in towards the bowling ball. Precisely. It's going to be attracted towards that distortion in the space that the bowling ball is sitting on. And that's where Einstein comes in. Exactly. That's, it's an incomplete, but it's a useful illustration of what we're talking about when we say that gravity, that mass distorts space. I love this stuff. I love this stuff, too. I've actually been studying um, gravitational theory this semester. It's my first graduate level course, and it's been a lot of fun. 
remember when I was in physics, I'd be walking around the lake and stuff, and I'd be thinking, at this speed and the velocity, blah, 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 blah. Everything yes. was all mathematics. That's the best thing to do when you go on walks. And all that mathematics, my social life was going to heck. You know, all my friends were like, mm. You just tell it to them anyway. The ones who stick around are the ones that are going to be the most fun to talk to. And the ones that get sucked into my gravitational pull. <laughs> While the others know how to orbit fast enough so they don't get pulled in. <laughs> So, Jamie, you successfully made it from high school to college, and now you're doing your master's degree in physics. And what suggestions would you have for someone who is thinking about college or yeah. you know, a student in your STEM program? What words of advice would you have for them? Oh, there are so many. <laughs> a really big one is to not get discouraged and change careers at the first, at the first few setbacks because there are going to be a lot of them. Um, even when things seem like they're going really well, you're going to eventually run into that one professor that isn't terribly interested in working with you or that one task that you just can't imagine a way for you to do. But that's not a reason to completely change courses. It just means you need to take a minute and think about the problem a little bit differently. Maybe talk to other people who have managed to overcome similar problems before. Yeah, that's the thing. You got to keep on moving forward. You can't just become complacent and, you know, accept failure. Right. When I started college, I was going to study psychology. It wasn't that I was especially interested in psychology versus other sciences. It was mostly that it was a science that didn't require a lot of math and didn't require a lot of complicated labs like chemistry. But I was settling. You know, I enjoyed it enough, but it was just something that I was settling for. This is going to be easy enough. And then I still ran into problems in my math classes that almost prevented me from finishing college at all. And it occurred to me then that if I'm going to run into barriers when I'm already settling for something that I thought would be easy, then why settle at all? Why not just go for what I'm really motivated to do and then actually have the energy to deal with those barriers when I hit them? Jamie, what... What sparked your interest in science and physics? Oh, that's... I mean, was it a Lego set? Was it something someone said? But do you remember where the seed was planted? Um. Well, I think it started when I was really young, and my dad would tell me about things that he was reading. So I remember uh, the first conversation that I really remember having with him about physics was about the twin paradox, which is, say that you have two twins... And one of them is an astronaut, and he gets on his spaceship and flies at very close to the speed of light away from the Earth. And then he comes back. When he gets back, his twin is going to be much older than he is. Mm. And this is a paradox that we investigate when we're discussing relativity. And my dad was telling me about this and kind of walking my six-year-old self through all of the implications of it. And it was fascinating to me. And I remember I just asked him so many questions after that. And I think that's kind of when I started realizing that if I do science, I at least have this one contact that I can talk to about it because my peers weren't talking about this stuff. We're six years old. We're talking about rugrats and throwing sand at each other. But if I wanted to enter the science fair and do an experiment with electricity that essentially involved turning a lemon into a battery... That was something I could talk to my dad about, and he would ask me questions that would take what I thought I understood and absolutely shatter it to pieces and essentially just leave me to pick up the pieces again and try to understand it again. And I think that's where my excitement with science really started. Well, that's really cool that you had that. I don't think it really came together, though, until I was also excited about math. Problem solving, word problems, puzzles, the whole, hey, your dad... The whole works. I always loved it when that light bulb went on inside my head. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things about physics. Just when you think you understand it all, something comes in and just shatters your intuition. And then you get to pick up the pieces, and that's so much fun. So, Jamie, what else would you tell someone that is specifically interested in physics or mathematics? Um, I, I can't stress enough how important math is to all of us. Like, you, you really can't have one without the other. I sometimes meet physicists, physics students who tell me that they much prefer physics to math. And I kind of look at them and roll my eyes a little bit and wonder, how can you have one without the other? How are these things separate to you? I don't see the separation between them. 
you need math as a language to express these ideas. If you're interested in science, I would urge you to not neglect your math and try to apply it to your science and find what makes the math beautiful as well. Jamie, making math accessible has always been a concern to a lot of people. How did you make math accessible to you? A couple of ways. I've worked with readers, and that has pros and cons to it. Obviously, you need a reader who understands the symbols they're reading to you. Otherwise, you're going to get things like squiggly line of F times D times X, but that doesn't make any sense at all. So having a good reader is really important. Also, Nemeth code is incredibly important. It's difficult to access, which is to say it's not being produced as much as I think it could be. And when it is produced, it's bulky. So you're going to have a math book with something like 12 volumes, and that's being generous. But it really gives you the opportunity to read things nonlinearly, to move around on the page and see how does this piece of an equation physically relate to this other piece of the equation. It, it just it makes it easier to manipulate things. Second to Nemeth code, I would say, is being really good with a computer. You can type a lot of things. A lot of what we're working with in Algebra and Beyond are functions. Kind of like, I'm not sure how familiar you are with programming, but you can type out a function really simply as just function name parenthesis and then put in the arguments of the function. And it's, it's not exactly the same in appearance as what you're probably seeing in Nemeth code or in print, but it can have the same meaning. The symbols are really arbitrary. It's the meanings that we assign to them that really matter. So whether your symbol is some character in Braille or some character on your computer or some sound that you're familiar with from somebody reading to you, it's just a symbol. We can change those as we need to. Just so you understand it. Exactly. And so you can communicate it with somebody else. The eloquence of mathematics making it beautiful. Great job, Jamie, especially what you're doing with the STEM program, taking what you know and bringing it to the transition age students. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, you know, it comes down to the teacher of it. And when we have the Supreme Court talking about the idea, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, saying a meaningful education, it really comes down to the teacher who is getting into the ear of the student. I really want to applaud what you're doing for all of us. Thank you. Because those students are going to get a teacher who gets it. That's really important. I've had people who have never worked with anyone with a visual impairment before try and teach me how to do things to address my limitations. And sometimes it goes really well. Sometimes they just really seem to get it. But other times it just... it. it it falls in a hole. And so I feel like having that experience of struggling with this and then finding a way to fix it puts me in a really good position to teach other students who are interested in science and math how they can achieve those goals. Let me ask, do you see yourself continuing your studies in this or do you see yourself going into the teaching aspect? I don't think I'll ever completely take my hands off of that. Leaving the research and doing education. You kind of need both. If you want to be a professor in a field like physics, or any field really, and you want to work in an academic institution, you're going to have to teach. It's part of the job. And it's an important part of the job, and I feel like a lot of professors miss the importance of that. They really want to be working on their research. They're underpaid, they're overworked, they've got so many different things that they're trying to do. And now they have to go and teach this class of freshmen that F equals MA. And I think it frustrates them. But at the same time, when you have to go back and look at the basics and really take them apart in a way that somebody who has no experience in your field can understand, it helps you understand. And it helps you build that new generation of peers. A competition drives innovation. If there are more people in your field with ideas that really challenge your own, that's only going to make your own ideas stronger. And I feel like that's really commonly missed and something that I don't want to miss in my work. So I don't think I'm ever going to take my hands off of the education side of things or the research side. They're going to play into each other really nicely. As a teacher myself, I found out the more I taught, the more I learned. <laughs> yes, and that's so huge. I used to tutor at the Colorado Center for the Blind, and my students were studying algebra. And there were so many occasions when I would walk them through the process of, say, completing the square. 
And they would just give me that look like, what did we just do? And I'd walk them through it again. And they would look at me like I was speaking another language. And then by the third time, I finally catched the piece that I was missing. That just made the entire process make no sense at all because I was leaving out this really important step. Awesome. We've been talking to Jamie Principato, a physics major at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Jamie, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with our listeners here at Blind Abilities. And, you know, I hope we can get together again and see how your program went this summer, your STEM program, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And I hope you can come back on. Awesome. It's been great talking about mathematics and physics. Oh, yeah, that was really fun. Thanks so much. Thank you. It was such a pleasure talking to Jamie. She has such enthusiasm for math and science, and especially with the STEM program. And if you're interested in a STEM program, contact your state agency and see what opportunities they have for you. Thank you for listening. And until next time, bye-bye. When we share what we see through, through each, each other's, other's, through other's eyes, eyes, we can then, we can then begin, begin to bridge, bridge the gap between, between the limited, limited expectations and the realities, and the realities of blind of abilities. Blind. Realities of blind abilities. Of blind abilities. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com. On Twitter at Blind Abilities. Download our app from the App Store, Blind Abilities, that's two words. Or send us an email at info at blindabilities.com. Thanks for listening.